Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at TradFlex.com. Today we're talking about how to fix a stiff or a tense arm action. If you're struggling with that issue or you're a coach with athletes who are struggling with that issue, definitely stick around for the entire video. Let's get into it. So let's go ahead and get into the video. First, what is a tense or a stiff arm action? Let's define that, make sure we're on the same page. So I would define that as being characterized by excess or improperly timed muscle tone and contraction during any phase of the arm action. Now, basically this can mean muscling up or excess tension anywhere from handbrake through the arm swing, through the early cocking phase, through the late cocking phase or the layback phase or into ball acceleration. So anywhere in the entire uh, arm path or arm acceleration, um, there could be this muscling up phenomenon happening. happening. So we're gonna unpack that kind of general uh, vague term and talk more specifically about the, the specific issues that occur at different phases of the arm action. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, now that we are on the same page about what it is, is it actually a problem that needs fixing? And the answer obviously is yes sometimes, but I just wanna make the point that it's not always something that needs to be addressed. Here's Nathan Ivaldi. So as he breaks the hands, he really kind of stabs and extends that arm uh, kind of in a very stiff and, and uh, kind of muscle, I would consider a form of muscling up. Um, but again, it works for him. He throws 100 miles an hour. He's a big leaguer. Nothing I would change there. So it's not always an issue. If the athlete's having success, if they're throwing hard, if they're at the level they want to be at, you don't necessarily have to make the change. But again, we're talking about this for athletes who aren't where they want to be and they're trying to have a more efficient arm path. So uh, what are the different forms of a tense arm action? So if it's happening in the arm swing, you'll usually see this manifest as an Eovaldi uh, with some sort of stabbing or hooking. During that initial arm swing, you'll see a stab, or you'll see a hook or a wrist hook back behind the, the body. So that's a really common form. Uh, the flip up or the early cocking phase, so as the arm comes through the actual uh, the flip up phase, the arm gets lifted up into that high cock position. You usually see, often see upper trap tone or shrugging. So as that arm lifts up, the upper trap starts to take over and it becomes a very tense uh, action of lifting the arm up into position. Sometimes you'll see yanking into elbow flexion where as they lift the arm up, they use the bicep and they kind of contract and they bring that hand to the ear. And so it becomes a very tense uh, early cocking phase of the throw. Uh, hand versus scap driven, a lot of the times when athletes uh, break their hands, it becomes a very ball driven or hand driven arm action to lift that arm up into position versus letting it be more of an elbow or a scap driven, uh, loose free and easy arm path. So during the flip up, that's commonly what you'll see. Uh, limited scap load as well, uh, kind of a dead giveaway when the athlete really doesn't allow that arm to freely get back behind the body um, into scap retraction and horizontal abduction. So if they get to landing and they're kind of, kind of in this very tense position where they don't have that retraction, uh, so a limited scap load, again, another form of having a tense arm action. Uh, lat dominance or yanking with a low elbow, they might have a pretty decent arm path and then right into landing, they yank down hard with the lat. Um, that's a sign that you're improperly firing the lat at the wrong time. Uh, if the elbow gets low at landing and you're really seeing them dig into that lat right before front foot contact, a lot of times you'll see excess elbow flexion or pushing into acceleration where they're too far inside 90 degrees and that elbow starts to lead the way into layback. And so we're gonna unpack all of these, kind of discuss uh, some ideas for fixing them, show some different case studies. So understanding the cause of why you have a, t a tense or a stiff arm action, uh, you first need a diagnosis of exactly what's going on. It's not always the same reason for every single case. For some guys, it's a mobility issue. Have you done a movement screen? Have you identified what your mo uh, mobility issues are and how those might be linked to your arm action? Is it actually limiting performance? We already showed uh, Nathan Ivaldi's case. Is it something that you can specifically identify is why you're not throwing as hard as you want or why you're having trouble commanding the ball? Um, is it an issue that actually needs to be addressed? Is it just a patterning issue? So do you have excellent mobility? You ace your movement screen, uh, but it's just something where, you know, you've been taught an improper pattern or coached an improper pattern and it's something that maybe can be addressed from a drill standpoint or a cueing standpoint and doesn't need to be looked at from a mobility standpoint. So again, this comes back to uh, mechanics and a, mo a movement screen um, with the athletes that we coach. We coach uh, almost 400 athletes remotely at the moment. Uh, this is not negotiable. This is something that in order for us to really prescribe and diagnose uh, their issues and prescribe a, a legitimate uh, training and throwing program for them that actually addresses their issues, we need to really understand fundamentally what's going on from a mechanic standpoint, what are their flaws, and then cross-reference that with their movement screen. What's actually going on from a mobility standpoint? Do you have the range of motion to actually get into some of these positions that we're gonna to try to ask you to get into on the mound? And if you don't, that's again, something we're gonna to need to address. So it's often a combination of mobility, throwing, and training interventions to address a tense or a stiff arm action. It's not as simple as, hey, do this one drill and you're just gonna magically be better. It's figuring out exactly what the issue is, how it's manifesting itself, and then what are your mobility limitations? What are your patterning limitations that are leading to that? Again, no one size fits all approach. As much as you want to hear that there's a simple drill, there isn't. Um, and so I'm gonna give you guys drills at the end of this video that you can go and try, 
But again, I just really want to hammer home this point is that if you're not getting a mechanical or movement screen and you don't really understand the core of how your body moves and how that's connected to your issues, you're really kind of taking a shot in the dark with your career, with your mechanics. Just one example of you know, one of our 30 plus uh, movement screen videos that we'll have athletes film. Uh, we call this the field goal test. But again, if an athlete's struggling to get into that scap loaded position and they can't even get the arms back behind their body, just standing up doing a movement screen, how are they gonna do that when they actually have to go and throw? So let's kind of break it down piece by piece. I'm just gonna kind of go over these very quickly. Um, each of these could kind of be its own video in the future, but I just want to show you kind of the totality of all these different scenarios that could be going on so that you see it's, it's kind of a complex issue. So part of the problem with uh, when an athlete stabs or hooks is it creates arm timing issues at landing. And so if you basically, are, if you have this tense stabbing action, a lot of times what you'll see is the arm is actually late getting up on time at landing. And so the issue is that it creates this arm timing issue. The arm is now in a down position at landing and it isn't in a good spot to actually accept layback and accept that rotation from the trunk. A lot of times the stabbing and hooking actually comes from something else going on in the delivery. Uh, a lot of times it's building in time for an inefficient tempo or inefficient lower half. So if an athlete doesn't understand how to shift their weight properly, maybe they have a really uh, slow tempo or they're stalling with their lower half and they're just taking forever to get down the mound, the arm has to build in time somewhere. Um, this is a lot of times why coaches harp on, if you can have a little bit of a faster tempo, you're not gonna have as much time to screw up the arm action. You're not gonna have as much time to screw up the throw. Again, that's something we can get into in a different video as far as the optimal tempo, but just understanding that it's all connected. The arm action doesn't function in isolation from your lower half. With guys who have a stabbing or hooking issue, a lot of times we'll do a modified starting position, right? Because they stab from the very start of their handbrake, they get into a bad position that leads to a timing issue. A lot of times we'll eliminate that initial handbrake and we'll start them already up at landing and do different modified drill variations where we get them to feel Hey, what does it feel like to have my elbow in line with my shoulders at landing with my shoulder closed with my elbow at 90 degrees? What does that feel like? And can I go through a delivery that way? Can I go through different drill variations that way? And once they feel that, now we can start to backwards chain. Hey, now we can actually get into the full arm swing and see if we can still pass through those same positions. Or hey, we're getting really comfortable here. Now can we start here and still get the arm up on time? Great, that's, that's easy now. Now can we do the whole, hand, the whole arm swing or the whole handbrake? So modified starting position is very important for these guys. Uh, this is Connor, he's a former athlete. And again, just a very, uh, very clear example of this kind of stabbing arm action, driving down, hooking the wrist, way back behind the body. And again, for him, it would lead to some major timing issues where at landing, he was still down and he wasn't able to access that layback in his shoulder because of this timing issue. And for him, it all started with the lower half being inefficient and with this initial stabbing movement. Upper trap tone and shrugging, again, common one. Part of the struggle with guys who are upper trap dominant is that trap dominance it creates a self-perpetuating cycle. This goes for a lot of different movement flaws, but when you start to use your upper trap in everything that you do, you start to use it to lift that arm into position, um, guys start to become upper trap dominant, and now every single row they do in the weight room becomes an upper trap dominant row. Every single push-up they do becomes an upper trap dominant push-up. And so their lifting starts to perpetuate and make the problem worse in their throwing. And now every throw they do is making the problem worse. And they just become more and more and more and more and more upper trap dominant. And so it's kind of a self-perpetuating cycle that you have to get in there and really address it on multiple levels to actually fix the problem. Throwing, lifting, and mobility interventions, right? You can't just say, hey, we're gonna do some upper trap tissue work and try to fix the problem. They need to understand how to relax that upper trap when they actually go through their arm swing. They need to understand how to relax it and actually row and press from the right muscles in their lifting programs. And they're gonna need some mobility interventions for sure as well, once you've actually identified that that's the issue. So just kind of a case study for an athlete that we worked with. He's a, a pro player right now. He actually ended up getting drafted, but at the time when we first worked with him, he came to us and he was, he'd be 90-91 in the first inning and then he'd have this rapid drop off. He would say it started to feel like his upper trap was taking over. His arm just didn't feel relaxed by the second inning and he'd be 85, 86, 87. His velocity would just tank off after the first inning. And interestingly enough with him, I've written about him a little bit before, you know, he came to us pretty, pretty skinny. I think he was like 6'3", 175 pounds, pretty skinny, but relative to his frame, his upper traps were extremely overdeveloped, which was kind of a telltale sign that that's what was going on. So he got a lot stronger. We addressed the issue um, in throwing specifically. For him, it was focusing on kind of a relaxed arm swing. Um, another way of thinking about this, is relax the face, relax the tongue is kind of a, an interesting one I came across. A lot of times that's like, the, that's the very last place you hold tension. So if you relax the tongue or relax the face, you kind of unintentionally, subconsciously relax everything else as well. But as he began to lift his arm up, he really started to get into his upper trap. And so as soon as we fixed that, he started to take off. He got up to 96 that year, got drafted, and he's actually able to sustain his velocity deep into starts, deep into outings now. But yanking into elbow flexion, in this case, it's more of a misunderstanding of how to raise the arm. It's utilizing um, 
active effort versus utilizing kind of that free energy from gravity and from the momentum of the handbrake to get that arm up and into position. It's actively trying to lift the arm by flexing the bicep and yanking the elbow versus letting the natural flow the movement, lift the arm up and into position. Sometimes it can, again, be building in time for an inefficient lower half. And a lot of times this is linked to a pushing acceleration pattern. So if an athlete begins to yank into elbow flexion to get their arm up and into position, nine times out of 10, the very next thing they're gonna do is shoot the elbow forward and tricep push into ball release. So this is a very damaging pattern for an athlete to revert to uh, or default to because it ends up leading to that pushing pattern. And it just is a total velocity killer. So. We need to make sure we can address that if that's an issue. Again, here's an athlete that, uh, that we work with, just kind of demonstrating that. So instead of kind of letting the arm naturally freely spiral up, as soon as he kind of gets to that point where he has a mobility limitation, his body kind of reverts to yanking up into elbow flexion. Limited scap load, another issue where you're gonna see uh, you know, athletes struggle with having a tense or a stiff arm action is that as they kind of go through their arm path, they don't let that arm naturally spiral back and behind their body and get this opening and this, this stretch through their pecs and this retraction of their scaps. Um, the problem with that is that they never actually access what's called the stretch shortening cycle or this, this elastic properties of the pec. And so if you never let the elbows get back behind the midline of the body, get back behind the body and let those scaps retract, you never actually access this rubber band like effect from your pec when you throw. If you never let them get back here, then you never create that stretch and fire effect from your pec. So it's an inability to leverage the lat in the pec to accelerate the arm. Most of the time, this is a, mo a mobility or a tone issue. It can be uh, tissue work, static and active stretching, uh, interventions to address the pec, subclavius, lat. Um, there's a number of different tissues that goes, go into an inability to get an effective scap load. So you, know, you must be able to relax into position to create that deep flip up that we constantly talk about. If the arm doesn't flip up behind the head and at landing, then it's unlikely you're gonna be able to maximally leverage the pec and create these deep positions to actually power your arm into ball release. Blake Snell will put him up here. Um, he's just a great example of what I'm talking about as far as scap load, but he's not actively yanking the elbows behind the body. He's letting that arm naturally float up the spiral staircase, relax into position, and because he's got great mobility through his chest, he's able to easily get into this position of scap retraction uh, and flow through these positions dynamically. And so for him, that's a big reason that he's able to throw as hard as he does is because he's able to get that free and easy arm spiral where he's not limited at all through his pec, and he's able to maximally leverage the lat in the pec and access that stretch shortening cycle uh, capability of those muscles. And here's just another example of that. This is an athlete that I currently coach. On the left, so he, he's a guy who kind of struggles with muscling up. Uh, decent overall patterns, but he really starts to tense up when he throws. He'll get really fast down the mound, and he'll get really tense, and he doesn't let that, that scap fully retract. And so for him, actually slowing him down a little bit, cueing him to relax, cueing him to let the arm float and get deep, um, on the right is he was basically sitting easy 90 miles an hour at a low effort bullpen compared to 85, 86, 87 the same day before he cued that exact same thing. And so for him, that was a big unlock. We can actually see how significant of a difference that is in terms of the flip up, in terms of the scap retraction, um, significantly deeper positions that he's able to get into. And we can also look at the facial expression. It's not always a perfect indicator, but when you see the face start to tense up, too early, that's a sign that they're starting to apply effort too early into the throw. Relaxed face on the right, arm getting to significantly deeper positions and lower perceived effort to create that velocity. Pushing into acceleration. Again, another way that having a tense arm action can manifest itself. Now this happens later in the throw. You might have a perfect arm spiral, get into deep positions, and now you begin to accelerate your arm and now the arm starts to tense up. It doesn't want to accept that layback. This is often linked to excess ball weights. So doing maybe uh, four pound pivot pickoffs or throwing a two pound, pulling down a two pound ball or doing something where the ball is a little bit too heavy. Improper drill selection or cueing or improper ball weights can often be a cause when an athlete suddenly develops kind of this pushing pattern one year and they didn't have that pattern at all the year before. A lot of times it can be linked to, hey, did you do some sort of weighted ball program? Again, we use weighted balls. We're not against them at all, but it can very much be used improperly if the right drills, bad coaching or improper ball weight selection are used. And so we have to look, take a closer look at, hey, what did that program actually entail? If your pattern doesn't actually improve, is that something that actually helped you or didn't help you? And so we're looking a little bit closer, we can often identify that they were going a little bit too heavy on a lot of these drills. So what happens is the arm perceives that as a threat. So let's say I'm trying to throw a four pound ball. And I'm trying to relax into layback, relax into my acceleration, but I've got a four pound ball hanging off my arm. What your body does is it perceives that as a threat. And so it starts to tighten up the positions it starts to get the elbow out in front of the body more times than not. It starts to climb the elbow 
and it starts to use the tricep to accelerate the arm rather than dropping into layback and whipping the arm through. Um, and so that's more of a protective mechanism, but it doesn't correspond to what high level throwers actually do who throw 95 plus miles an hour. So um, again, just a really common cause of pushing into acceleration. Again, push first pull. So the arm catapults versus unwinding into ball release. It becomes pushing action versus an unwinding whip-like action. Again, tricep versus a pec and lat driven action. Here's an example right there. So if this looks like you, if this looks like your acceleration pattern, uh, this could kind of be what's going on under the surface. But again, he's hitting that layback and he's accelerating way out in front of his face. Now, the cool thing about when you have a pushing arm action is a lot of times this is a quick fix. A lot of times it's just explaining it to the athlete. If there isn't an underlying mobility issue, you can have kind of a, a drastic turnaround immediately or within a week or two just by them understanding, hey, I need to relax into layback. Maybe I need to back off how I was doing certain drills. And a lot of times that can come back pretty quickly if it's just a bad habit that the athlete was creating. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of all, all kind of these different uh, subcategories of a tense or a stiff arm action. So I wanna give you guys some specific drawing, throwing drill and cue examples that you can actually go and test and try for yourselves. As far as drills, here's a couple that I like. Um, first, if you're struggling with relaxing into layback, the lasso drill, we just posted a video of this uh, a couple days ago is a good example of, of a way to improve that. So basically you're gonna set yourself at a landing position and the athlete's gonna feel, hey, this is what it actually feels like when the shoulders are closed, the arm is up at landing, the arm's on time, and I'm just gonna rotate and let that arm relax, lag behind a hair, and whip into ball release. So if the athlete's struggling with that acceleration phase, again, you can kind of condense the throw into starting at landing position and just focus on that specific piece of the throw. As soon as they get that, now you can backwards chain the rest of the throw. Now you can start to add in the, the, you know, a linear move, loading the back hip, a leg lift. You can start to add all these things in, but if they don't even understand fundamentally how to relax into layback, you need to start there. Capturing momentum issue. So is it a guy who, again, they're yanking their into elbow flexion or they're stabbing or they have some other sort of inefficiency during the initial arm swing? Uh, figure eight drills are one of our go-tos for that. And the point of the figure eight drill is to get you to feel that fluidity and that momentum of the arm swing before you even go into the throw. And so just adding that initial figure eight uh, downswing before getting into the throw, it helps athletes feel, hey, I just need to capture that same fluidity that I'm already feeling. So that's just a really good uh, feel and a really good way to change the movement trigger. And again, we'll put some of these up on the screen here so you can see. Uh, there's a timing issue. So the athlete's late at landing or he just, he doesn't understand how to hold the torso back until the arm actually gets up at landing. So he starts to fire before the arm actually gets up or he He's very, very late at landing. Again, and again, we've already talked about this, but we'll do abbreviated arm action or modified arm action variants. So we'll actually start them up at 90 degrees of elbow flexion and at 90 degrees of abduction. And so we might do a rocker drill from here. We might do a pick off from here. We might do a 10 toes throw from here, but it's just modifying that starting position so they feel what it's like to have the arm up at landing and have the arm up at, to accelerate, uh, to, to accept that layback during acceleration. So again, ton of different sub variants of what that means, but I'll put a couple of those up on the screen here. Uh, tension 10 toes, or really any sort of variation of an arm action drill where you actually have to go through it in slow motion first, and you feel these patterns build, you feel the tension, uh, you feel the, the relaxed arm swing, but then you feel what it's actually like to get into this high cock position, the scap retracted position in slow motion, and then you actually build in speed from there. So the tension 10 toes, you might just go through a slow motion, feel the arm path, feel the arm up, and then fire. And so as you start to feel the coordination between that and between the torso, now you can add in speed. Now you start building up. We'll have athletes build, start at 20% speed, then 30%, 40%, 50%. And 20 throws into the session, now they're at full speed, but now they've understood how to actually time the arm action with the torso rotation. Um, so again, ton of different variations of what that actually could mean, but breaking it down, slowing down the speed of the movement can be very beneficial as well. Cues, we've touched on a few already, but capturing the momentum of the downswing is a super helpful one for guys. Understanding, hey, I've got all this free energy from the handbrake. Can I keep that loop of energy going instead of just losing it down here and then having to start back over and yank the arm up into high, the high cock position? Can I feel that loop take me all the way up into that high cock position tension free? From there, you're gonna be in a much better position to actually apply force to the baseball. So capturing the momentum of the downswing. Another way of thinking about this is floating the arm up the spiral staircase. Again, I like that, uh, that image of float because it cues you to keep relaxation 
If you're used to using your upper trap, if you're used to tugging into your lat during your arm action, you're used to stabbing with your tricep or yanking with your bicep, the idea of floating, it's just, just let that arm do its thing. Float up the spiral staircase, again, gives you the idea of the proper pattern of the arm spiral and the proper way of actually getting the arm up into position. The infinity loop is kind of my way of visualizing this. So basically, it's, you can think about an infinity sign, but I've talked about this in other videos before. Basically, the glove arm is gonna track one side of the infinity loop, and the throwing arm is gonna track the other side. Now, as the arm flips up and the glove arm tucks down, that's gonna kind of complete the infinity loop, and then during acceleration, you close the loop. So it's not like it's gonna make this exact shape as you go through your arm path, but it's just that visual of, hey, I'm trying to capture as fluid of that figure eight as possible during my arm pattern. It's not stabbing, lifting. It's, can I capture this loop of energy during my arm swing? And so just changing that frame of mind can oftentimes be a huge unlock for guys as well. Again, here's just an example of, of an athlete who had a major timing issue. He kind of had a pushing arm action issue. And for him, we were doing a figure eight rocker throw. So this is an example of kind of that figure eight initial start. And we were also cueing him at the same time to capture that momentum of the downswing. So as opposed to kind of yanking that arm up, hey, can you just take this momentum that the ball's already given you, capture it, let it swing your arm up and back, and accelerate from there once the arm actually gets all the way up. And for him, that was a 15 minute change. That just took a little bit of coaching, a little bit of giving him kind of the right cues, the right patterns. And that was a pretty quick unlock for him because it was more of a patterning issue than necessarily a mobility issue. So again, I just wanted to give you guys a general overview, show you kind of how in-depth this question really is and kind of how we break it down uh, and kind of go much more, uh, much more in-depth with analyzing our athlete's mechanics. Again, it's not as simple as just having one drill or, or you know, specific prescription for guys who have a muscling up uh, arm action or tense arm action. It gets way more in-depth than that and that goes into why we have to have such an in-depth movement screen, in-depth mechanics assessment for each athlete. Guys, thanks so much for watching. If you haven't already liked this video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you're not subscribed to this channel, uh, make sure to subscribe to us if you find this content valuable. And if you're struggling in your own career, shoot us an email. We're happy to hop on a call, discuss your mechanics, discuss your own situation, and discuss how we might be able to help. See you guys in the next video.